grace falls short. Lord, um, as much as we may not always sense your presence, Lord God, regardless, your presence is evident. And you promise to us that you will be with us. And you promise that through your scriptures, your uh, written word. And Father, we uh, take hope in you. We trust in you because of your goodness, not because of our abilities or our own faithfulness that always fall short um, or our own uh, understanding because our understanding is really limited and limited. So we ask you that you will allow us greater wisdom today, Lord God, even through your word. May your presence deeply touch your hearts, Lord God, this morning as we uh, are still in the Lent season and that we are looking forward to um, Palm Sunday, uh, Good Friday, and Easter. <clears throat> as we remember and relive the narrative of your birth, life, um, death, and resurrection, and the Holy Spirit coming, Lord God, um, we ask you that you will allow us to experience you in a special way that we never knew before. Lord, because without you, we, our lives are in vain. And uh, the author of Ecclesiastes, um, obviously, um, having lived a long life, looked back and said, everything that he owned, that he enjoyed, were meaningless. And therefore, we need to, um, while at the same time, enjoy the gifts, uh, every gift that you have given us uh, on this earth. However, fear the Lord and keep his commandments. And Father God, lead us to that direction. Help us head toward the right direction. As Christian education, Lord God, whatever the methods that we use, Lord God, help us arrive at the point of being in the right track that leads closer to you, Father God because that is our heart's desire. And Father, so we dedicate this session in your hands. May your Holy Spirit minister to our hearts, Lord, and your name be known, and help us have a better understanding of who you are and how good you are, so that we may turn to you, not just in time of need, but at all times, according to the purpose that we have been created, God. We thank you, Lord, in Christ's name. Amen. So, um, last time we talked about John the Baptist uh, preparing the way, um, and we're going to just uh, briefly go over and then go on to the next session just to remind ourselves where we um, stopped last time. The beginning of the good news about Jesus the Messiah, the Son of God, as it, is, as it is written in Isaiah the prophet. I will send my messenger ahead of you, who will prepare your way. A voice of one calling the wilderness, prepare the way for the Lord, make straight paths for him. And so John the Baptist appeared in the wilderness, preaching a baptism of repentance for the forgiveness of sins. The whole Judean countryside and all the people of Jerusalem went out to him, confessing their sins they were baptized by him in the Jordan River. John wore clothing made of camel's hair with a leather belt around his waist, and he ate locusts and wild honey. And this was his message. After me comes the one more powerful than I, the straps of whose sandals I'm not worthy to stoop down and untie. I baptize you with water, but he will baptize you with the Holy Spirit. At that time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the Jordan. Just as Jesus was coming up out of the water, he saw heaven being torn open and the Spirit descending on him like a dove. And the voice came from heaven, You are my Son whom I love. With you I am well pleased. So. 
this is a, the new uh, section, new um, passage that we're uh, seeing today. So last time we, we saw uh, John the Baptist, uh, who lived a very short life, um, but he's considered as the greatest man who ever walked on this earth, who came out of a woman uh, by God. And uh, his ministry was to prepare people's hearts um, so that when Jesus would Jesus came, um, they would know and um, believe that Jesus is the prophesied Messiah. Now, um, at the time, Jesus came from Nazareth in Galilee and was baptized by John in the garden, uh, John in the Jordan. Um, Jordan is where John the Baptist did his ministry, like I said before. And um, I think I briefly mentioned the fact that Jesus, not because he had sins to be forgiven or needed to be washed away, um, because he chose to come down to the earth, just like just to live like you and me. Um, there are many reasons. Um, he wanted to empathize with us. He wanted to show us that he loves us so much. He wanted to let us know that um, he is always with us, but also at the same time, he had to be in human flesh so that he could shed the blood on the cross. The blood has a lot of meaning, but um, just to briefly mention, not to talk about the entire concept, um, was that um, in the past, in the ancient times, um, animals were sacrificed for people's sins so that the priest would lay hands on the animal that was brought um, and then um, pray for this individual who brought the animal and say, you know, all his sins or her sins have been um, transferred over to this animal. And then that animal was sacrificed because God is holy. He's completely holy. He cannot even um, bear with just a hint of sin. And we would die in God's presence if we have ju even just a little bit of sin, which all we always have, right? Um, I'm not saying that it's okay. It's not okay, and that's why animals have to be sacrificed. But um, God saw that this was like nonstop. Uh, he, he saw how fallen human beings were, and that um, um, they were actually not going to be very perfect. And, you know, um, not even close, not even wanting to be perfect as the Father is for perfect. And so he had to come up with a plan B, sort of, which means um, his plan A was that human beings would um, sincerely follow him and repent of any of their, uh, and, and, and he probably wished, like you and me, that Adam and Eve uh, completely followed him. And um, even if they made a mistake, they would have turned around and confessed their sins and be forgiven, right? But that never happened. And he knew, he saw the pattern after pattern that uh, human minds were very easy to conceive um, sins um, that leads to eternal death. And um, Father God never wanted that. And so he sent his only son, Jesus Christ, to be the ultimate sacrifice that shed the blood. So once and for all, um, all the sins will be taken care of, of the past, present, and future, of every, every all humanity's sin. And so in order to shed blood, you have to have flesh, you have to have a human body. And that's uh, why he came as a human being. That's one major reason. And we're going to actually get to see um, uh, next week uh, why, why it had to be that way. And so he didn't have a sin, but he, he wanted to. He, he's like the second Adam. The first Adam miserably failed and uh, disobeyed God and brought the curse upon the earth, upon humanity. But um, Jesus is the second Adam 
He was born of a human being, 100% human, 100% divine. And he represented, representing all humanity, fallen humanity, he perfectly obeyed God to the point of death. So in this scene of being baptized by John is because is not because he's lesser than John. John just confessed that after me comes the one who whose sandals I'm not worthy to untie. You know, the lowest servant would untie and tie, you know, people's shoes and uh, wash their feet. Um, and John is saying, even if I were the, the lowest servant, I would not be worthy of untying this person's sandal because he's so great. He's almighty. He's magnificent. He's the, he's the Lord of Lords, King of Kings. And so um, John is like, you know, if, if you read other um, synopsis, other gospels written by different authors re regarding the same stories, um, you can see that John is withdrawing, like, oh, you know, Lord, I need to be baptized by you, but why are you coming to me? But Jesus said, um, it is good to be done this way, so baptize me, meaning he's representing all humanity, all those sinless. And so you baptize me um, so that um, all these people uh, will be symbolically baptized for baptism of repentance. But at that time, something very unusual happened, something that other people did not, other human beings did not experience when um, baptized. The heaven opened and the Spirit of God descended on Jesus like a dog. And there was a voice from God, you are my son whom I love, with you I am well pleased. He's confirming who Jesus is. You're my son. So why did he do that? Um, and I'm well pleased. You don't have to do a single thing to please me. You are my son and you're already pleasing to me. So a couple of things. God is confirming Jesus' identity as a son. Number two, because Jesus is representing all humanity, God is saying, my creation, my sons and daughters, I love you the way you are. I'm not going to leave you the way you are because that's, that's not loving. But I love you because I created you with my own hands because you are my sons and daughters. Not because you have done anything to please me and anything that you do or don't is not going to make me love you more or less. I love you and it's not going to change. Doesn't mean that we can keep breaking his heart, uh, running away from him by sinning. If we do that, then we are breaking the covenant. And because God operates by his laws and principles, he has to send us to the eternal, um, eternal, you know, death place. Um, and, and you and I really don't want to go there. But he has given us the free will and a sincere desire to, to want him, to, um, to choose his path, to be good, to be holy, to be loving. And we have desire to be with him uh, ultimately. And that desire is expressed in many different ways. It, and sometimes we find that that desire is expressed in a very sickening, dysfunctional way turning to other kinds of idols. Um, and so, um, that's another story. But surely, Jesus' identity as Son of God was confirmed even from the beginning of his uh, ministry. At once, the Spirit sent him out into the wilderness. The, the, so the Holy Spirit came upon him, and the Holy Spirit actually led him into the wilderness and Jesus was in the in the wilderness for 40 days being tempted by Satan 40 days and tempted by Satan he's God he's 100% divine and why is he tempted because he was also 100% human and he was representing all humanity he was a second Adam 
And so he was tempted in every way that any human being can ever experience. So there's no simple temptation that Jesus did not experience. Can, can, can you imagine? For 40 days, Satan did everything to tempt Jesus. He was with wild animals and angels attended him. So before the angels started to come and uh, attended him, if you read other uh, versions of the same story, then uh, you can see that um, he was tested in three major areas and uh, he defeated all of them by the word of God. Satan actually came, brought and utilized the word of God as well to tempt Jesus. But um, his word, his use of the word of God was slightly distorted and he, he utilized the word of God in order to manipulate Jesus to mainly test his security of identity as the Son of God. If you're the Son of God, do this. If you're the Son of God, do that. But Jesus, having been confirmed already um, for his identity as the Son of God by, by Father, he was not shaken. And so he, he de uh, defeated the enemy by the Word of God, which is the sword of the Spirit, and the enemy went away and he started to wait for the opportune time to come back and persecute and tempt Jesus again. But he defeated all the temptations. He, he defeated the enemy right there then. And then um, he um, started to, angels attended him and he started to do powerful ministry. After John was put in prison, so John the Baptist did a very short ministry. And he was thrown into prison and finally he was beheaded. He was martyred. Um, because the, the enemy really hates those people who prepare the way of the Lord. Um, and John the Baptist uh, just paved the way. For the Messiah, which is uh, um, the greatest thing that any human being can do. And um, right now we're, we're waiting for the second coming of Jesus Christ and people have to prepare um, the way for his second coming now. Now, he, uh, John being um, hated by the enemy, he was beheaded, but um, his death is not meaningless. It bore much fruit. And uh, many people turned to Jesus, believed him because of John's work. After John was put in prison, Jesus went into Galilee, proclaim, proclaiming the good news of God. The time has come, he said, the kingdom of God has come near. Repent and believe the good news. This is the message that he preached. The time has come, the kingdom of God has come near. The kingdom has a king, right? The kingdom has king, the kingdom has territory, the kingdom has sovereignty, the kingdom has power and influence, right? And God's kingdom, although invisible, has all those aspects. A kingdom has king and subjects who are citizens, and the citizens are distinguished from the people who are not citizens who do not belong to the kingdom. And we're going to talk a little more about this later. And his message is, repent and believe the good news. What is the good news? The bad news is that Adam and Eve, the first human beings, and perfect, who were created to love God, to be loved God by God, and who were living in perfect harmony with God, actually chose to go against him and broke the covenant was expelled out of the Garden of Eden. They brought curses on the earth and to all humanity. That's the bad news. Now the good news is that the story does not end tragi uh, tragically, but God had a plan B, which is Jesus Christ. That is the good news. So Jesus calls his first disciples as Jesus walked beside the Sea of Galilee. 
he saw Simon and his brother Andrew casting a net into the lake for they were fishermen so um, Simon and Andrew um, actually were fishermen Jesus said come follow me and I will send you out to fish for people there were fishermen if you go to the Sea of Galilee um, it's a lake but it's so huge that it looks like a sea actually uh, but the water is not salty because it's a lake and um, there are many different kinds of fish that live there um, St. Peter's fish and other kinds of fish um, and there are tons of um, shellfish that people never have touched looks like yeah and um, you can just uh, walk on the uh, walk into the, the ocean and right beneath your your feet are all the clams <laughs> shellfish it's incredible now um, this the the lake is large enough that later you get to see if you if you read um, the entire gospel you can see that the disciples are actually in a boat um, you know moving from one point to another and there's a storm it's almost like a an ocean right to have a storm and their um, boat was about to be fl flipped over and their life lives were at risk and so they shout out, shout out to Jesus um, please rescue us right please save us now um, so there were fishermen and they've been fishermen for a long time and Peter was Simon Peter was actually uh, a married man, so he was a mature person. Um, and and Jesus, when they when they see them, um, actually they know their name, and he knows their names already. And he says, "I'm gonna make you not just a fisher fishers of fish, but I'm gonna make you a fishers of men." So. Um, in this uh, brief description, because Mark is the shortest version uh, of the Gospels, um, if you look at other versions, then you can see the details, such as um, Jesus saying uh, to Peter, "Hey Peter, why don't you throw your net to the right into the deeper ocean? Um, and, and, and Peter goes, well, he's an expert. He's been doing this for a long time. Maybe his parents, his, his grandparents were for sure. Fisherman, um, but um, he says, throughout the entire night, last night, we threw our nets to the best places, we caught nothing. But because you say so, I'm gonna throw the net. And when he did that, actually the net was filled with fish, hundreds of fish. And um, as he was trying to you know, gather the fish, the net was actually breaking. And so um, he needed help and then barely they were able to um, put all the fish on the boat. And his immediate reaction was not, oh goody, you know, here's a miracle performer. No, he just realized, okay, by your word, you, you speak and, and I obey and this miracle happens. I know that you are divine. Um, and uh, I feel your presence, your divine presence, and I feel uh, so sinful. I realize as I encounter you, I realize that I'm a sinner. So please depart from me. I'm not worthy of being with you. Like you cannot mix with me because I'm spiritually dirty and you're so holy. Was his confession. Now um, Jesus did not leave. He said, come follow me. I will make you a fisher, fisher of men, fisher of people. At once, Simon and Andrew left their nets and followed Jesus. When Jesus has gone a little farther, he saw James, son of Zebedee, 
and his brother John in a boat, preparing their nets. So they were fishermen too. Without delay, Jesus called them, and they left their father Zebedee in the boat with the hired men and followed him. So um, here in the book of Mark, uh, in the Gospel of Mark, one thing that is really notable is that you know uh, Mark utilized the word at once, immediately, often. And it's giving a sense of urgency that when we hear the gospel, um, that might be one of the very few chances or that might be the last chance, the only chance that we get to hear, that, that the chance that is given us for us to be able to make that choice, be right with God, and um, start walking the path of righteousness that leads to um, being united with him completely, joining the okay, um, wedding banquet of Lamb to enter into heaven. So um, there's a sense of urgency in that that might be the, the only opportunity or Jesus might come back very soon. And so the chances are given and we need to really take um, those chances with uh, gratitude is uh, what, what Mark is saying. So Jesus, after being, after defeating the Satan, being, uh, being filled by the Holy Spirit, he goes out, well, he, he was filled by the Holy Spirit first, defeated the enemy, and he starts to go out. And number one thing is, um, he doesn't start doing ministry solo, like a hero, heroic figure, because that's kind of a Western idea, right? Uh, one hero actually, appears like he he's got everything he is you know, superman basically and he has the ability and insight to be able to take care of all the problems for people but jesus did not do that although he's divine he gathers his disciples one by one and these are not um the elite group these are not the most powerful group these are not the people who has uh, the political influence or were considered as privileged. They were not highly educated. They were not even of good character either. <laughs> but the only thing that he saw was their willingness to respond to his call. And he, I believe that intentionally, chose to um, gather, to call these individuals who are not who did not have high profile to show that that anything that they do in the future um, is by the power of God and not their own might because that's how God can be known to people because that's so important for him that people come to know who God is and that it's known that they put their faith in him because that that's such an urgent matter I believe that God chooses, oftentimes, not all the time, God chooses the people who are not highly qualified. Now, how, what was his ministry like? They, so now Jesus and the disciples, right, went to Capernaum, and when the Sabbath came, Sabbath is the uh, the day when they were called by God to honor um, God and to rest from work, um, Jesus went into the synagogue and began to teach. So, uh, well, yes, uh, Jesus did his miracle of, uh, you know, uh, telling Peter to throw his net uh, in the most unlikely place and uh, he allowed the miracle of gathering uh, hundreds of fish, but then um, one foremost thing, most important thing that he does is to teach. So he, he uh, if you look at his uh, ministry, Jesus in his ministry, like healing or miracles or whatever that might be, like casting out of uh, casting out uh, demons, he did teaching first, or he asked people a question first because people's mind has to respond first. They have to believe 
they have to understand the truth, then when you powerfully minister to them, they will be ready to receive the, the miracles. And so Jesus went into the synagogue. Synagogue is like the ancient church and began to teach. The people were amazed at his teaching because he taught them as one who had authority, not as the teachers of the law. So the teachers of the law were considered uh, really privileged and they were well respected. They would wear long robes and they would walk around on the street and people would just like, oh, you know, like we, we, we want to show um, our respect for you. But still, um, they did not have the authority that Jesus had. Just then, uh, a man in their synagogue who was possessed by an impure spirit cried out, what do you want with us, Jesus of Nazareth? So very interesting. So uh, while the people of God did not recognize who he was, um, he was recognized by a demon. And the demons are the spirits, impure spirits. And um, they're spiritual beings, and therefore they recognize other spiritual beings, right? And uh, what they're saying, what this impure spirit evil spirit says is what do you want with the jesus of nazareth have you come to destroy us i know who you are the holy one of god wow be quiet said jesus sternly come out of him because this man was possessed by the evil spirit right the impure impure spirit shook the man violently and came out of him with a shriek the people were all so amazed that they asked each other, what is this? A new teaching and with authority. He even gives order to impure spirits and they obey him. News about him spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. So his teaching was not like the head knowledge. It was not a transference of information. It did contain information. But ultimately, he was doing something in people, around people, among people. So his teaching is different from other kinds of teaching that we know. Because when he teaches, then something happens. Not just understanding, not just being informed, but something happens. The kingdom of God comes through his teaching. The kingdom of God comes in different realms in the spiritual realm you know by you know being cleansed by the it was uh, from the evil spirit um, physical body being healed our minds and memories being healed our relationships being healed when we hear his teaching something significant happens because he teaches by the authority and by the way when we read the bible Seeking God, not just taking this as like, oh yeah, this is one of the best sellers, which is true, and it has that value as a best seller too, like it's worth reading. But if we ask the Lord, um, God, I want to know you more, can you please speak to me? And then if we read this with that uh, open heart, then the teaching that is described in this Bible actually comes true in our lives. And I have, I've, I've heard so many stories of people who testify that while they were reading this particular passage about Jesus healing someone, and I took it by faith, Lord, may it happen to me as well, that actually healing took place. So, um, I'll give you an example. So, there was another... Um, so, the, so we, we had a small group and we gathered for Bible study and all of us really love the Word of God and so um, yeah we were just uh, learning we were memorizing verses we were talking about the verses we were analyzing and we were sharing and so one of the things that we um, did was to um, actually go back home. So we were gathering just once a week and for just a few hours, 
which is a lot, but then, you know, that's not enough, right? And we went back home and we were memorizing verses every, every day. We were uh, meditating on the Word of God every day. And we were really taking it by faith. Whatever it says, uh, for example, we just read um, that uh, Jesus defeated the, the Satan, the enemy, by his word. Um, and so we're like, oh, okay, you know what? Jesus did it, but because he represented all humanity, and he wanted to show us an example of how to engage in spiritual warfare, I want to use the word of God to defeat the enemy. So when uh, certain thoughts come into my, our minds, where somebody gives us a hard time uh, unreasonably, and we want to pray, you know, oh, because Jesus defeated um, the enemy by the word, I'm not going to preach to that person, but um, I'm going to pray. And I'm going to say, you know, Jesus, you had the authority, and I have you on my side. I declare war against the enemy, the spirit of darkness, division, jealousy, or, or whatever. Um, I rebuke it in the name of Jesus. I, I, fo I follow Jesus' example. And then, um, as you do that repeatedly, at one point you see um, crumbling down of the enemy. Um, the other person, um, but it can be many different ways. The other person can change, which would be the best, right? Or the other person actually leaves, or um, somebody else comes in to actually um, bring a resolution. So, um, or, you know, the word of God that I read today was that Jesus, although um, these people who came to him were sinful in their hearts, Jesus did not turn them away, saying like, oh, I'm so holy and you're not unholy, you're not holy, and therefore like, I don't want to associate with you, but rather he sat down and ate with them, and therefore I'm going to actually extend my love to these people who may not know Jesus. Um, and even if they are not friendly toward me, or even if they're, um, you know, they're not loving at all, they're not friendly, but I'm going to actually love them. Not blame, I'm not saying that you should be doormats, no. Uh, but there are occasions when you have to kind of, when you're called to bear with it and be patient with them. And they see there's something different in you. And so, like, these are the things that we were doing in that Bible study, through that Bible study. And so we, we would go back home um, in different directions, and uh, we actually practiced that. And one of the ladies actually had a um, severe form of um, severe form of uh, sleeplessness, you know, insomnia. And she um, had that problem for many years, and she was on medication. Um, and she said that even with medication, I'm not able to sleep. And so that was kind of, we didn't know, like, oh, you know, we feel so sorry for you. Like, so she's like, oh, I slept for 30 minutes last night, you know, although I was lying down for eight hours. Um, this whole week, like, I didn't sleep more than five, five hours. And we're like, oh, how can you manage? How can you, how can you even show up? And uh, she certainly did look like she had, um, many like she she did not look normal because she, she was seriously lacking sleep and so weeks and weeks passed and she complained of the same problems and she said i'm not able to memorize verses because i'm lacking sleep and i don't have a good memory um, i was never good but it's getting worse and so then um, the leader of the bible study actually challenged her you know um, there, there was actually a person who had um, um, Alzheimer's and she was losing memory and she could not remember even um, a single thing. But as she immersed herself into this Bible study and believed that God would heal her and started to memory, you know, do the memory verses, one day she was able to memorize one verse. Next time she was able to memorize two verses. As time passed, she recovered her memory and she was not outside much anymore and so when when she shared that this person was greatly challenged and um, and um, 
the leader actually shared other people's testimonies about how they were healed of physical and mental illnesses and of course spiritual you know spiritual sickness as well and so then this person over time uh, probably week five or six into the uh, the Bible study she took it by faith that she could be healed that she could memorize that she could sleep and actually um, one day she showed up and we you know there was a public restaurant at the time this is way before COVID and so there was a bathroom and we, we lined up during the break time to go to the bathroom and she was in, right in front of me and she turned around and her countenance was completely different she was smiling she was her face was um, bright and she seemed to have very very much uh, in peace and uh, we never we had never seen her like that so we're like so I asked her a question you look very well today um, how are you and she goes last night or this past week uh, for for a few days for the first time in many years I was able to sleep for a, a few hours a day longer hours a day and and we're like whoa how did that happen and she's like I'm not taking medication anymore and we're like well so what happened and she shared our testimony later on to the entire class that um, she had been taking by faith everything that she was reading and um, she actually found out that it was the spirit of darkness that was giving her insomnia and it was not uh, as described you know it, it was not to be resolved by medication or going to a doctor or even like trying different strategies to sleep but rather she turned to the word of god she filled her mind uh, all day long um, i don't think she had a job because uh, she was a slightly older person um, and like all day long she read the bible and all day long she was meditating and all day long she was taking it by faith that it it became hers like the truth was not just applicable to those people who are described here but it will become mine because what God is saying here is not just oh this is a fun story oh this is like a uh, a fairy tale no this comes true even today and she took it by faith and one day she declared you know what um, the word of God heals me and she did that for a few weeks and at, at first it was not working and she was very much discouraged but as time passed she realized oh there's something different about me I seem to have more power and authority I'm gonna actually drive out this enemy called insomnia and so she kicked it out and ever since uh, she was able to really sleep well and oh boy at the end of the um, whole course uh, we took pictures together and when we see her it's like oh she has the most beautiful smile on her face her face is so bright and it is a miracle and probably her doctors would not be able to describe why uh, they would uh, not be able to explain the reason behind her healing um, so verse 27 says the people were all so amazed that they asked each other what is this a new teaching and with authority he even gives orders to impure spirits and they obey him this happens although Jesus is not walking on this earth anymore he ascended into heaven right and he sent the Holy Spirit the Holy Spirit is filling this whole universe and he is at work especially through the Word of God and this is still happening when we meditate on the Word of God. Praise be to Him. News about Jesus spread quickly over the whole region of Galilee. You know, um, these days people all, uh, many people would say that uh, PR is very important, right? Because um, without properly and especially because uh, we are living in um, you know anonymity like we sometimes don't know our neighbors right we sometimes don't know um, 
because of the, the nature of mobility. Uh, the mobility has increased dramatically ever since uh, industrialization took place um, centuries ago, right? Two centuries ago, maybe? And um, not two centuries, but at least one century, right? And um, it is very difficult to uh, know people in depth. In a rural area, in an agricultural society, people were uh, staying in one place for 20 years, 30 years, maybe their entire life, and for five generations maybe. And they knew each other by face and by, uh, by name. And um, if they go to, a, say, a pharmacy or to a, a, a mechanic shop, they would call each other by name because like we know you know we, we know who runs this um you know shop and we know what kind of person this is and so like if a, ever a, a new person shows up in the community they immediately spot him or her and say like where are you from like why are you here <laughs> but we're not living in that kind of environment anymore and so there's a like we, we don't know each other so, um, but the thing is, um, so um, the, the time has changed, uh, but the Holy Spirit is there to minister to each one of us. And so by His Spirit, we are able to kind of discern um, and we move by His guidance. Um, and so, um, when Jesus went up to heaven, um, he sent the Holy Spirit in behalf of him. Not in behalf, but I would say uh, to do greater work. Because uh, Jesus chose to limit himself as humanity. He was limited by three-dimensional world. He was limited by time and place. Um, but the Holy Spirit is not limited by that. And he knows each one of us. Uh, when we don't know each other, G Jesus knows each one. And the Holy Spirit certainly knows each person. And so he's the one that we can rely on in this um, situation. Now, um, Jesus. Now, um, his ministry started. And word spread today because you know back, back to the anonymity we we believe that PR is very important and without uh, proper like um, PR and um, you know letting people know who you are um, you are not recognized but in the um, in this time when somebody does something extraordinary like this is unbelievable i know that this cannot be done by any regular person no matter how genius no matter how uh, powerful this person might be um, nobody can really <laughs> duplicate this so then when jesus performed his miracles the word spread really quickly without him having to do pr because um, um you know when such a thing happens it goes viral even on social media right well, they didn't have social media back then, but um, when something extraordinary happens, then you cannot really hide it, you cannot really deny it, um, and the words spread really quickly. Now, um, he goes on to heal many other people. As soon as they left the synagogue, they went with James and John to the home of Simon and Andrew. Simon's mother-in-law, he was a married man, his wife's mother was in bed with a fever, and they immediately told Jesus about her. So Jesus went to her, took her hand, and helped her up. So she, she must have been in a very uh, serious condition to be bedridden, right? But the fever left her, and she began to wait on them. Immediately, she's like, okay, my fever went away. I'm well. Now I can serve you. This is miraculous, right? That evening, after sunset, the people brought to Jesus all the sick and demon possessed so then when people see something oh he has the power to heal you know i have my family member who is sick oh this person has been demon possessed 
and acting crazily for 30 years. Let's see what he can do. And so like, all the sick people were brought by their friends and family. The whole town gathered at the door. The whole town. Can you imagine? And Jesus healed many who had various diseases. It could be physical, it could be mental, it could be spiritual disease. He also drove, drove out many demons. But he would not let the demons speak because they knew who he was. Yeah. So this is uh, Jesus' ministry teaching to let the people know the truth and then you know he rebukes the enemy drives out the enemy and they're either you know physically mentally spir uh, spiritually relationally they're healed and what else did he do so this is like the next morning right very early in the morning while it was still dark Jesus got up, left the house, and went off to a solitary place where he prayed. Simon and his companions went to look for him, and when they found him, they explained, Everyone is looking for you. This is early morning, while it's still dark. Now they started to perform miracles, and people were get getting healed. It's like nonstop, 24-7. Oh, wow, people are crowding at the door. Uh, I want to receive healing. Please, please, please. And uh, there is a great need. And hence the uh, disciples are letting him know. Everyone is looking for you. Jesus replied, Let us go somewhere else, to the nearby villages, so I can preach there also. That is why I have come. Wow, so instead of saying, oh, you know, there's a huge need, okay, let me go heal like five more, 500 more today. Instead of doing that, he says, let's go somewhere else. What is that? Doesn't it sound a little bit like um, uh, not loving? You know, it doesn't sound that he, he is loving. It doesn't sound like he um, has compassion to our people. Because there's such a great need. But he knows what to do and what the priority is. He connects with God the Father first, early in the morning, spending time with God when everyone is looking for him. Um, and he says, uh, let's go somewhere else. I don't have to heal everyone on this earth. That is not my mission. My mission is to connect with God and to preach the gospel. That I know that sounds a little bit um, illogical maybe, but he knows what his priority is. Or he knows that preaching of the gospel, speaking of the truth of God, proclaiming it is more important than healing each individual. And he knows what time is what time? He knows how he is supposed to carry out his, his day. So Jesus traveled throughout Galilee, preaching in their synagogues and driving out demons. Perhaps he knew that healing is important to people, and of course, and it's part, part of the manifestation of the kingdom of God. But perhaps he saw that that preaching of the word actually sets them free spiritually and their relationship with God is restored which is much more important than just immediate healing and not knowing about God because even the non-believers were healed so the best thing that that um, anybody with healing gifts can do is to preach the gospel let the other person know who Jesus is and allow that person to accept Jesus as Lord and Savior, then go for healing. But even if that is not possible or if that does not happen, God chooses to heal anybody that he chooses to heal. But then physical healing itself will not have much meaning if this person ends up not knowing God and therefore 
although physically became well, ultimately goes to the eternal lake of fire, where God's presence is not. So then, Jesus knows the priority before anything else. This is why he came, to save people, first and foremost, in their relationship with God. They need to be restored to the relationship with God. Um, otherwise, anything that I do is meaningless. Maybe he understood that. Um, maybe he understood it that from that direction, from that perspective. Jesus heals a man with leprosy. A man with leprosy came to him and begged him on his knees, if you're willing, you can make me clean. So this person already has faith that Jesus can actually heal him. Jesus was indignant. Why was he indignant? Because this work was done by the enemy. He knew. He wanted to... Uh, this person has been suffering for so long and with such severe symptoms because of the enemy. And that, that's why he was indignant. And this is um, holy anger. We can be angry at someone and our anger is never perfectly holy because um, uh, we ourselves are not holy, completely holy. And therefore, when we get angry, there's a little bit of sinfulness even in it. Um, even if we get mad at somebody who is uh, unjust, there is uh, a little bit of sinfulness mixed with it. Does not mean that we should not do just, you know, we should not do bring justice. You know, we should not strive to bring justice to this world. We should, but um, his anger is different, qualitatively different than our anger is what I'm trying to say. So Jesus reached out his hand and touched the man. I am willing, he said, be clean. And notice that he does not utilize anybody's name. Um, he does not say, by Father God's name, be clean. He doesn't do that because he himself is the authority. He doesn't have to utilize anybody's name. While you and I, uh, if we, you know, if you become a believer, then you can use the name of Jesus Christ to um, cast the demons out, to heal people and things like that. Um, we cannot rely on our own might because that's not sufficient, you know. But when we rely on the name of Jesus Christ, then um, it is done powerfully. So Jesus did not have to rely on anybody else. Immediately, the leprosy left him, and he was cleansed. Jesus sent him away at once with a strong warning. See that you don't tell this to anyone, but go, show yourself to the priest, and offer the sacrifice that Moses commanded for your cleansing as a testimony to them. Instead, he went out and began to talk freely, spreading the news. As a result, Jesus could no longer enter a town openly, but stayed outside in, a lo in lonely places. Yet the people still came to him from everywhere. Right. So there's a reason. I mean, um, instead of letting people know, like, oh, okay, I am the Messiah, I'm the Superman, I came to rescue you. No, he was doing this secretly and quietly, for a reason, because he wanted to wait until the perfect time of God. He knew God's timing, when to reveal himself, when not to. And this was a time when he was not supposed to reveal himself. And he warned uh, the leper, you know, after healing him, don't talk to other people, but just show yourself to the priest so that you can be reconciled to the community, so you can walk around and meet people and talk to people again. But um, he did not listen, so he just went out and said, No, like, I suffered from leprosy for so many years, and I was not able to go out and visit any one of you. Now I'm clean. Look at this. Jesus of Nazareth has done this. And so then um, he couldn't open, uh, openly enter into town anymore. He had to hide and, um, you know, uh, do his ministry uh, even more um, quietly. So this is uh, Jesus that we're talking about when we refer to him, when we talk about Messiah, when we talk, when we talk about his teaching methods, uh, what Christian teaching is about, because he has such a 
Uh, he is the most important figure when it comes to understanding the methods of teaching, methods of Christian teaching. Last time we actually um, talked about talked about um, several people who are very important uh, traditionally, historically, who have um, contributed to today's Christian teaching methods that we know. Uh, we're going to talk a little more about uh, a few more people, and then we're going to actually move on to uh, talk about learning because uh, uh, teaching is important, but it's very important for any teachers to understand the process of learning or uh, different perspectives uh, regarding learning because uh, we want to know whatever we're doing is actually effective and um, different audience has different needs, different age groups, different genders, perhaps, um, different backgrounds. We want to cater our teaching to, to um, the specific audience. Um, sometimes um, in, in this kind of class setting, it's hard for me to um, kind of discern how to target which person because people come with various backgrounds. You know, they, they come from different cultures, um, you know, different linguistic abilities, different uh, understanding about Christianity or um, different age group too. Um, it's a very, very diverse group. Um, however, I guess I am aiming to target uh, not the, you know, not by the number who, like, you know, what kind of people come uh, and who is the majority of the class, but rather just trying to be easy enough and to, um, to assume, to, not to assume that you come with a certain background information, not to assume that you know so much about uh, Christian faith or Christian education. So, um, but then still, um, it may not be as, it, it may not register in your hands if you come with like completely, um, have, have no background in Christianity. But I'm praying and hoping that the Holy Spirit is at work with you so that he um, actually is speaking to you and giving you understanding and with, you know, giving you the wisdom to be able to understand what I'm teaching and what's written in the book. Um, that's part of the reason I can't rely on, on my own might. Um, it's especially challenging when it's online um, because I don't get to see your faces, I don't get to see your reactions. However, um, I am trusting God that He's doing something even through the online teaching. So, uh, page 20, you know, we, we covered quite a bit before and um, Erasmus, um, you might have heard this name because he's very famous, right? Um, he lived between 1466 to 1536 AD, so 15th to 16th century. Erasmus was a reformer who advocated humanism and the education of women in both society and secular schools. We, we talked about this, I think. Um, he was really radical in that he believed in women's education and also um, humanism. He fought the corruption of the Catholic Church while wholeheartedly asking for unity and opposed the division of the church by Protestants. Um, Thomas More, a friend of Erasmus, uh, Thomas More wrote the uh, Utopia, a look at an idealistic utopian society he, like many other human educators, advocated education for women as well as men. So that famous book, Utopia, right? That Utopia, he believed that Utopia could um, take place on this earth. It is only possible if people are um, filled by the Holy Spirit and they're willing to actually uh, live a sacrificial life to make it better for other people's sake. Uh, we have not seen a utopia yet. We have seen a smaller community of utopia-like um, society, a group of people. 
um, at least for a period of time. We want to be able to extend that um, to wider groups and we want to be able to see um, more of a permanent community that is like that. But um, now that we became so um, um, we, we have seen so many failures, now we hear the word utopia, it, is, it has a connotation, right? We tend to look at it as, oh, you know, like he has utopian ideals and like he is not really in touch with the world. You know, when, when, you know we, we may use the word utopia in order to describe a, a person who is idealistic and not realistic, right? But um, it is possible, but it is not possible by human might, though. It is possible by the Spirit of God. When we humble ourselves, when we recognize that we are so sinful, um, that we need God, we need to invite God, then a utopia can happen. But without God, that is, there is no possibility of making it um, happen. Martin Luther, an Augustinian monk from youth, Martin Luther taught theology at Wittenberg. He struggled with the idea he and everyone else was not good enough to earn his salvation in the Roman Catholic. That he, um, if we are justified by our works, then no one could possibly succeed. In 1517, he wrote um, 95 theses on this and other things he saw in the Catholic Church that had um, corrupted his teaching focused on many of the points he highlighted, uh, including justification by faith, supremacy of the script scripture, and the priesthood of all believers. He believed in personal study of the scriptures in the original languages and state-run public schools. And we see the aftermath of this. Um, he did a great job um, making the Bible available to all and he did a great job, um, you know, restoring that idea, the original biblical idea of people meeting God personally. And they did not have to go through another agent or like a priest or bishop or, um, you know, someone who is greater than them. But rather, because of what Jesus has done, because he, he chose to come down to the earth. And he poured a veil between God and humanity so that anybody who has a desire to know God through his blood, through his name, be able to go to God and not perish. And um, Martin Luther actually restored that biblical idea so that people will actually start seeking God on their own, including the scriptures. So we talked about Ignatius Loyola, uh, Francis Xavier, John Calvin. John Calvin was a lawyer, um, a lawyer turned reformist. John Calvin was another very gifted individual. He refined Augustine's theologies on sovereignty and predestination, creating what is today called Calvinism. So in 1536, Calvin wrote the Institutes of the Christian Religion, a systematic theology book that vi uh, vigorously attacked the theology of the Roman Catholic Church and because of the power of the RTC had to run away to Geneva to escape them. While there, he writes a commentary on the entire Bible. So this is quite a scholar. A big difference between Calvin and Luther was Luther's humanistic teaching philosophy. Uh, well, um, Calvin stressed the teacher's role in learning. So, um, Luther, uh, Luther turned to teaching philosophy versus Calvin um, emphasized the teacher's role in learning. And so, um, 
but the application is kind of strange. Encourage the use of strong corporal punishment. <laughs> I'm not sure if I agree with that, um, especially in today's con um, context. But certainly, he understood the role of a teacher, which I agree with. So 95 theses uh, were prepared and were uh, published, 1517, obviously. Council of Trent took place 1545. And then uh, we know Sir Francis Bacon, very uh, famous person. 1561 to 1621, an English philosopher. Bacon was a major proponent of the inductive method and wanted students to learn the meaning of the material and its use in the world as opposed to just the meaning of the words themselves. Um, inductive study, right? Although his teaching was focused more on the scientific and natural world, Bacon was a devout Christian and sought these methods to be used in the church. So actually science and Christianity are not uh, mutually exclusive or they are not opposed to each other. Uh, because science actually did come from God. Anything that is good, anything that has to do with um, knowledge and wisdom actually came from God. But anything can be distorted and misused against God. And it looks like for the past few decades, especially science has, uh, has been used to go against God. Um, but actually, if you study science in depth, science, archaeology, anthropology, um, you know, uh, astro uh, astronomy, or um, any kind of study in depth, then you will actually meet God. And so many scholars and um, intellectuals have um, testified to this, that when they actually really sought the truth through the field, you know, their own field of knowledge, they actually were able to find, uh, confirm that God exists, that he created this universe, that he is still at work. So King James Version was published 1611 and First Great Awakening 740, First Christian Radio Broadcast 1921. The first Christian radio broadcast is delivered in Pittsburgh, allowing Christian education to reach a wider audience. So when printing became available, then the Bible was printed. And so it reached the corners of the world um, and it became available for the public. Um, now, with the broadcast, it was even reaching um, anybody, everybody, um, pretty fast. And um, so then um, people had a chance, better chance of hearing the good news, you know, even if, uh, you know, nobody like yeah, in person visits them. They could hear the broadcast and they could actually uh, come to know Jesus that way. Although um, God more often than not uses people to, to reach out to people. Um, he, he loves that way. But then there are times when uh, people hear the gospel. For example, um, there are people that, I, that I've heard, that I've, that I've seen, um, talk, talking about the fact that they... Uh, met Jesus through their dreams or through their visions and one day you know a vision of Jesus uh, was unfolding before their eyes and it was so real they couldn't help but leave whatever they were, they were believing previously and then just decide to follow Jesus so that can happen God can use any methods he could use films he could use books he could use um, songs he could use anything in order to reach out to people, but then it looks like God loves to utilize his people, like people to people. Um, and so uh, we want to be mindful that Christian education is done most effectively, although we may utilize many different approaches, multimodal approaches, uh, we want to actually be available in person.
So ancient Greece happens 800 BC, ancient Rome happens 753 BC, Socrates 469 BC, Plato 469 BC, Plato. So Socrates and Plato are very important. Um, let's take a look at it. Uh, Socrates, um, the classical Greek philosopher, and he's called the father of moralism. Moralism uses Socrative or inductive and um, dialogical argumentation methods to teaching to try creating the most virtuous society. These are still used today as effective teaching methods. So Socratic um, approaches are still used. And we can see like different um, influences in our uh, classroom teaching as well. Plato. Uh, the father of idealism, the classical Greek philosopher, believed in reorientation of the student from intellectual and spiritual darkness into the light of the truth. His academy used the seven liberal arts and physical exercise to sort students into the societal caste, workers, warriors, and rulers that they would be best suited for in order to show people how best to live in society. His ideas on education for both men and women, run and funded by the government, is a big influence on American public schools. And then Aristotle happens, 384 BC, the classical Greek philosopher, the disciple of Plato, and father of realism, desired to make a good man, using reason to control his animal desires and activities, he placed high value on observing nature and reasoning from it, which provides us today with the natural sciences like astro uh, astrology, biology, physiology, zoology, chemistry, and physics, and the scientific classifications. Something significant happens there. So he was very good at like uh, dividing, um, and you know, dividing into specific fields of study. But nowadays, what what I see is like the reverse trend we are kind of integrating everything, right? We want to have like a holistic picture. I think there, throughout the industry, there's like um, a wave of thinking, a wave, uh, you know, there's a period of time when people are so, um, people think of it as very important to specifically divide up different fields of study and really analyzing in parts. And then after that, people realize, oh, you know what, we have gone through too far with bits and pieces because we are holistic beings and the world operates holistically we cannot divide up, divide them up and treat each part as if it were separate but rather we have to have the entire picture and although we may have different elements in there we need to actually um, see the, the entire picture to be effective and so like I think uh, recently, there has been more of, a, of that kind of intellectual movement. So all these people are influential in terms of uh, Christian education methods. And then Greece was conquered 31 BC, uh, stoning of Stephen. Um, it, this takes some, some background uh, story, background sharing. But we can do this a little later. So Stephen was killed in 33 AD, a faithful follower of Jesus, um, being persecuted by the Roman um, Empire, right? Um, well, um, I wouldn't say Roman Empire because um, Stephen was uh, stoned by the seemingly God-fearing Jews. Um, so these people, although John the Baptist actually paved the way for Jesus uh, to come in to present himself as the Messiah, to, to let people know that he is the one, um, many people did not put their, their faith and they were actually <clears throat> were killing people by the name of God, um, thinking that they were being blasphemous and that they were teaching the false truth, the, the you know, uh, false messages, false teaching. And so um, he was stoned and he, he died a tragic death, but his death was not meaningless. His death started, um, it, 
it bore many fruits, including Apostle Paul and other people who um, were taught by Apostle Paul. Um, he was uh, a main fruit that sprung up. And uh, we can see that even death, physical death in a Christian community or in the kingdom, is not wasted. Our lives are not wasted, no matter what happens to us, because God always counts our lives. He does not forget. He does not neglect. He does not dismiss even uh, one person's life. But rather, something good comes out of a person's death. And such was the case for um, Stephen. And Jerusalem was uh, destructed, uh, destroyed 70 AD. And uh, persecution for Christianity, uh, persecution against Christianity became really heightened 160 AD to 180. Um, practically all of Jesus' disciples were martyred. Uh, including the one who lived the longest life, um, John. Um, this is not the John the Baptist, he, he died early. Disciple John, who lived very long, but um, he died um, by being, uh, being in exile. So um, although he was uh, killed later, he died later, it's considered as martyrdom. And so practically everyone died, many of them died early, young, leaving their families uh, behind, which sounds really tragic. But their lives um, are more meaningful as they were willing to lay down their own lives. They've seen Jesus lay down his life for the sake of them and all humanity. And they, in turn, were able to follow the footsteps of Jesus, laying down their lives for, to honor God and for the sake of humanity, for the sake, sake of the faith. And the Middle Age, um, the Middle Ages uh, takes place 580 and it lasts for a long time, 1350 AD. And that's um, about uh, 850 years. And so it's a long term time. <clears throat> the Middle Ages are also called the Dark Ages. And for good reasons, education and enlightenment were not as much of a concern in these feudalistic societies as much as attaining and maintaining one's power was. Society fell away from the beauty of Greek culture and embraced the warring that marks what is almost an entire millennium of bloodshed. Not all is bad as seen by some of the church fathers and leaders who lived during this time, but the rising Muslim population and the scars of the church crusades against them would be felt for decades. So this is the general background of uh, Christian education methods. I mean, the whole history is important uh, in consideration because um, they all contributed to the forming of the methods that we know today. But finally, we're moving on to um, lesson five. This learning, um, I, I already mentioned, learning is very important. Um, teacher is very important, but learning is as important as it is because um, whoever learns the method, so the same kind of teaching can be done, it's the same kind of approach, it's the same kind of passion, the same kind of strategies can be used but then depending on how you receive it, it will take a different effect. And so let's learn about uh, learning. So we want to know about human development a little bit because um, depending on what kind of developmental stage uh, an individual is in, um, there has to be a different approach, uh, different methods need to be applied. So characteristics of a developmental approach. Developmentalism predicts what people will be like at different stages of life. And developmentalism views the stages as having an established order and direction. So uh, stages have order and a sense of direction. So 
a person uh, may be in, in between two different stages or maybe this person regresses and goes back to the previous stage or maybe skips over to a different stage that can happen but uh, nevertheless there's a generally a sense of direction right developmentalism affects what people learn and how they learn it it's very important that's why we want to know people's developmental stages developmentalism is a respectful uh, and disciplined way to view people we're not categorizing people and just you know dump them into the category uh, you know treat them with stereotypes but rather we want to know generally where they are at and um, know how they learn so that we can cater our teaching methods um, to fit that person so what are the assumptions be, um, behind developmentalism then? In essential attitude, uh, attributes, persons are more alike than they're different. So there's more commonality. Like I told you about like the difficulty and challenge of me um, seeing people coming from very different backgrounds. And I, I sometimes don't know how to target you know, the audience. But then uh, we have to understand that there's more commonality among humanity. The essence of humanness is carried in the genetic structure and is very respect, uh, in every respect inherent. The patterns of human development are in the nature of humankind. The patterns of development cannot be significantly altered. Developmental, develop, development can be seen in several interconnected areas of life. So then um, development has to do with uh, very in different aspects, right? Physical development, mental development, emotional development, social development, and moral development, right? And development must be understood holistically. We have different aspects to development, uh, you know, developmental stage or where we are at, but um, each individual is you know, more than the addition of different aspects, this person operates, you know, uh, spirit, mind, and body as one. Um, there's no, um, we cannot really compartmentalize each aspect and treat that aspect, but rather look at the person holistically in order to be able to provide the best methods possible. Environment can help or hinder development. So um, genes are very important. You know, um, how each individual is like is very important, but we have to understand that we also live in an environment and we interact with the environment and therefore, um, you know, we, we're mutually, so we're influencing the environment and the environment in, in turn is influencing us. And therefore, um, if we just uh, neglect that fact, then we will uh, not be able to successfully achieve our academic goals because um, that is well, really influential. That, that, when that factor is considered uh, or taken into account, then we can actually um, have a better picture. We have a better, more accurate picture, right? Development is best understood as a matter of losing limitation rather than adding something. Hmm. Hmm. So a human being is becoming more and more capable. That is true, but I think uh, we also lose some of the innate natures as well. Development can be stopped by adverse conditions. Yeah, um, a person, you know, for example, there's a, a trauma or abuse or something like that, then this person can actually freeze in one stage. And this person can be freed um, by being healed, but then this person also can choose to remain in that stage. Like, I'm not gonna change. Like, I uh, was hurt, and you know what? Like, I'm not gonna forgive, I'm not gonna move on. Like, I'm, you know, uh, it is not fair that these things happen to me and therefore I'm going to just stay in this mindset. Um, some people actually live with that kind of mentality and unfortunately they can, cannot move beyond certain uh, developmental stage because of that. 
who feel that the continuing pattern of human development throughout life is a uh, requisite requisite for fulfilling humanness. Yeah, so there are different models, um, and we're going to take a look at it. Okay, uh, the first is uh, information processing model of learning. Information processing. Hmm. So when the information is registered, you know we uh, we don't actually uh, take in all the information that that is pre presented before us. If we do, we won't be able to do anything because it will be so overwhelming. But there's a screening process how you know we spat out the most important pieces that, that seem to be more relevant to us and things like that, right? So information processing, model of learning. Learning, what is learning? Moving from the known to the unknown. So what I already know, like I don't have to learn again. But what I don't know, I need to know. And teaching students to think for themselves. Because uh, um, you can be fed with a spoon. You know, like when, when a child is very young, you can actually feed them with baby food or even, you know, solid food because they don't have the capacity to hold the utensils right and actually put it into the mouth, which, which takes a quite a bit of coordination, physical coordination. And then they need to chew and swallow and all that. Um, there's a rhythm to, to it. So then um, if they're capable, you know, at, as they develop, as they become more capable, then parents are like, okay, you know, now you can eat for yourself. So like um, they put some uh, peas or, you know, like some, some soft food in front of them. And then they begin to utilize their hands to reach and then to put it into mouth. And then later on, they gradually learn to use utensils, right? Um, thinking is the same way. You know, um, at first, the little children, they just need to be fed with information. Like, this is how you do it. Go ahead and do that. You know, that's no, no. This is yes. Um, call mommy, you know, things like that because um, that they don't have enough information to be, and they don't have the capacity to think for themselves yet. But as they grow older, okay, then you start asking them sometimes, you know, good questions, right? Instead of like, do this, do that, yes, no. Uh, instead of making choices for them. Okay, so first, do you want orange juice or milk? Do you want to go outside or do you want to stay home? Okay, what do you say? You know, when, when uh, another person gives you a gift. Um, oh, what did I tell you about the hot stove? You know, um, what is the time? If they grow, if they're older, then you ask them, um, uh, what is the time now? Like, well, what are you supposed to be doing right now? Oh, you know, get washed and actually work on my homework, right? Um, things like that. So, uh, at first, you know, guided questions, but the, later on, just sometimes silence, like just looking at them, you know, oh, you know what I'm waiting for, you know, uh, you know, you already know. And uh, later on, you know, as they, they become like teenagers, you set the boundaries, but still allow them certain um, a room to be able to think for themselves and come to a conclusion and also think about the consequences of their choice. Conditioning model of learning, conditioning, establishing helpful reminders and expectations. So like when you do this, then that's going to happen. Okay, cause and effect. Evaluating students' performance. So if you do uh, meet certain criteria, then you're going to get uh, certain grades. If you don't meet certain criteria, then you're going to get a different kind of grades. You know, this could be one of the uh, examples. A social model of learning. Demonstrating a planned example to students. Naturally living your life before the students. So social model of learning is highly Christian because um, I talked about this with my friends. Um, Christian learning is not about information transference, but rather it's when you hear certain information, then there's a uh, there's the application that follows. 
So it's not just theory, but it, it's always accompanied by practice. And that practice is directly related to what you have learned. So, um, you know, sometimes, you know, churches do uh, Bible quizzes or, you know, like, uh, uh, or they, they sometimes, you know, test. You know, if you want to become a teacher, you know, of the Sunday school, like you have to pass this test uh, above a certain score and things like that. Um, not, not that's important, but that's only a very, very small part of Christian learning um, and teaching. Rather, Christian teaching is about you living a life and then people watch you and then they do the same. It's almost like parenting because uh, when we see parents, sometimes we grow up in an environment where uh, parents say, okay, these are the things that you're supposed to be doing. Oh, that's, you know, you never, you, you never touch on that or, you know, don't, uh, don't do this because it's going to be really bad. Um, what they say has an influence and we, we you know, oftentimes, at least, you know, if we have a good heart attitude, we want to um, obey. We want to do what they tell us to do and not do what they tell us not to do. However, um, sometimes, you know, we've heard our parents saying, it's really scary because like, I told you not to do this, but then you're doing this. But you know what? I feel guilty because I sometimes do that too. So like, uh, what, are the, what are the bad habits? that parents actually uh, engage in with children, like without having to, like the parents all, you know, they might have not mentioned it or they uh, said like, don't do this, but then they're doing it because when they observe parents, parents are doing it. And so um, then it becomes really scary uh, for parents. Like, you know, like I really wish that my kid because I know that I'm not a perfect human being and I have my uh, bad habits, I really wish that my kids would not pick up the, you know, look uh, at the age of five, at the age of seven, they're just, you know, doing the same thing. And what am I gonna do? So like, I hear from parents, uh, this report, uh, they, that they're um, really concerned and they're frustrated to see their kids actually mimic what they, wish that they would not learn so just like parenting christian education has that kind of effect because it's not just about knowledge transference like if you if it's about just information then you say something you know a lecture for um, a few hours and then uh, you, you take notes and then that's going to be on the test and that's it so you, you gotta just you know give, give the correct answers and based on that you're graded but um, Christian education ultimately is about apprenticeship and it's ultimately about um, living out the truth. So then um, the leaders and teachers, you know, they're not just um, engaging intellectually, but they are engaging in every direction and it has the consequences. It has the effect on the person when this person actually puts into practice what they have learned. So that's social model of learning. Now, uh, expanding learning stages. Um, this, we go through different stages. And um, um, so there are developmental stages, you know, that has to do with our uh, physical, mental, social um, development. But then there are different stages of um, learning when it comes to learning about uh, learning uh, about Christianity, learning about Jesus. So um, stage, awareness stage, what do you mean by awareness stage? Then uh, basic recognition of fact, this is more informational, like, oh, you know what? These are the things that teachers teach us, how the preacher teach, talks about this. The community talks about this. I, I'm aware. Okay. And then the knowledge domain is, oh, this is a Bible. And the Bible contains stories um, about Jesus. And then the attitude is that I hear that you have a Christian commitment. And physical skills, habits, 
um, domain is you are teaching. Okay, so, so that's the awareness stage. And then um, comprehension. Okay, so this is a Bible. But then the Bible has stories about people and events, and especially about Jesus. It is the comprehension, sorry. Um, I'm willing to listen to you about your faith. I'm not making any judgments yet about whether or not I believe it. So like, this is like, oh, I understand. Oh, I really get it. But I haven't made any decisions. Okay. And the application stage is um, demonstrating the ability to use your understanding in a particular situation. So a certain situation happens. Oh, you know what? Something happened to me. You know what? The Bible talks about this. I'm going to actually follow the teaching and apply that to my own life is the application stage and analysis stage is ability to dissect learning into its parts and put it back together again so it could be inductive study it could be um you know just a exegetical uh, approach like analyzing the scriptures um and it is oftentimes takes dissecting you know uh, looking at different words sentences you know, word analysis, you know, um, um, looking at it from different critical perspectives. And then step back and look at the holistic picture. So um, overall, um, the entire passage actually is talking about this. The general direction is toward that. And that's analysis. And so find, uh, find the unifying themes in the Old and New Testament. So... We can read passages after passages, books after books, but then it is very beneficial for us to actually read through uh, quickly from Genesis chapter 1 to Revelation uh, chapter, is that 20, 24? That uh, from front to back, because that gives us a real uh, good whole picture. Like, then it makes more sense when we look at uh, different parts when when we look at it from this um, holistic perspective then we can see certain um, recurring themes we can see a flow we can see that um, although different parts may seem to talk about different things there's a kind of commonality and this entire Bible has this overarching theme and we can discover that and that's uh, what analysis stage can do and attitude uh, in analysis stage can be I am in the process of making a decision I'm still thinking about what you are asking me to do and synthesis or creativity stage uh, you know uh, by definition you have the ability to combine ideas from different sources and derive principles to establish a guide for living and problem solving. Uh, you're able to gather different ideas from different sources, but you can actually uh, synthesize, you can actually um, form um, a practical solution, practical approach, practical principle that will be applicable to different situations. And the knowledge domain says, uh, take passages from the law, the Proverbs, the Gospels, the Paul's letters, and find principles about Christian law. So you are kind of taking uh, information from different parts of the Bible um, in order to approach certain specific issues. And these are going to provide uh, solutions or guidance or direction. Um, Attitude-wise, I decide. Okay, so like, as I uh, come to understand that this really makes sense. By the way, the Holy Spirit is at work and illuminating the truth to me. Now, I'm ready to make a decision. And so the uh, skills and habits, um, you can say that I will set the goals, prepare, and teach and you will you will only watch an evaluation stage is giving value to the idea personal commitment 
prioritizing and evaluate real life events in terms of biblical standards. So I'm, I'm able to reflect back on what I've done or what I've said, what I had in mind, um, according to the biblical standards is uh, how you're able to do at this stage. I'm willing to let the commitments have an influence on everything I do and everything I think and everything I value. So it becomes, you become part of it. You become part of that kingdom, part of the community, and you start exercising uh, the truth in your life um, and be able to also share your faith with other people. At this point, you can become a teacher for other people. So uh, we briefly talked about developmental stage and um, how we can how we can actually develop from uh, like barely knowing, like aware awareness stage to more um, you know analytical, comprehensive, um, and then uh, arrive at a point. Of being able to synthesize, right, um, and evaluate. I'm not saying that um, these are the strict stages, and like there's a period of time that that you can actually uh, define, um, like you are in this stage, and therefore what you're able to do is this. Um, rather, it's a little more fluid than that. And you can actually go back and forth a little bit, but then there's a general sense of direction is what I'm um, trying to emphasize again. And then um, there are other aspects of developmentalism, and that's not the only thing. That's more of a biblical Christian perspective, but um, we also want to consider developmental stages that are developed by psycho uh, psychologists and sociologists um, because um, these um, these are not absolutes, but they actually inform us quite a bit. And these are based on experiments and observation, and so there's a value. So we're going to talk a little bit about that. We're um, moving on to Lesson 6, Developmentalism. So the first is uh, Erickson's Psychosocial Developmental Theory. Um, and it's an eight-stage theory. describes growth and change throughout life. So each stage has, uh, you know, certain conflicts. And if you are able to resolve the conflicts and you move on to the next stage, versus if you're not able, then you can actually stagnate. So it actually shares some similar similarities with Freudian theory, uh, but it's very different in many ways. Uh, what is different then? Um, you know, uh, one example is instead of sexual interest as a driving force behind growth, social interaction and experience as the determining roles. So, um, you know, Fro Freudian theory focuses a lot on sexual interest. So, like, that's the primary motivation that makes you grow. But um, in Erickson's terms, social interaction and experience determine your role and it affects on how you move uh, to the next stage or stagnate. And it covers from infancy to, to uh, through death. And um, at each stage, children and adults face a developmental crisis that serves as a major turning point. And successfully managing the challenges um, of each stage um, leads to the emergence of a lifelong psychological virtue. Okay, and uh, the next is uh, behavioral child developmental theories. Um, so this talks about the need to focus on observable and quantifiable behaviors. So, you know, they, they wanted to be scientific, they wanted to be able to collect data, and by counting, they come up with certain objective uh, observation points, uh, or they're able to evaluate a person was their approach. So John B. Watson and B.F. Skinner uh, were two main figures that uh, devoted themselves to developing this theory. 
So learning occurs purely through process of association and reinforcement. So um, it gives no consideration for internal thoughts or feelings, but you know you condition them like you you uh, guide a person by rewards, punishments, stimuli, and reinforcement. So there are um, at least two different types of learning according to their theory. One is called classical conditioning. Uh, the other is called operant conditioning. Classical conditioning involves learning by pairing a naturally occurring stimulus with the previously neutral stimulus. Operant conditioning realizes reinforcement and punishment to modify behaviors. So classical conditioning is more like presenting a stimulus, like, you know, ringing a bell. So ringing a bell doesn't mean anything. It's just, okay, I hear it, but it's just a bell, right? But say there's a dog and you ring a bell. Uh, 30 seconds after ringing a bell, you feed the dog. Then, uh, you know, when that's done so often, like every day you do that, maybe three times a day, you ring the bell and then uh, actually feed the dog. Then after so many days, this dog, when, when he hears the bell ringing, then without the presentation of the food, starts to, um, you know, uh, salivating. Meaning, uh, he's anticipating, okay, after the ring, the ring has a meaning now. The bell, uh, bell sound did not have any meaning before, but now the bell sound means that 30 seconds after, I'll be presented with, the, with food. So therefore, like I'm anticipating that. So like there's uh, uh, salivating. So uh, that's called classical conditioning versus uh, operant conditioning is, okay, so uh, it, it could be, you know, in combination of classical conditioning too, but um, okay, so I sit quietly and look attentively. Oh, and I do what mommy says, and then I'm rewarded with a piece of, um, I don't know, gummy bear. <laughs> Versus, uh, you know what? I run out to the street and just yell and run around. Oh, you know what? Uh, she gives me this look of disapproval and she grabs me by the hand. She um, actually pulls me um, into the house and she actually lets me in the corner, you know, tie my chair. Oh, so by that uh, negative reinforcement, I'm, I'm seeing that this is not being rewarded. So therefore, like um, you increase the possibility of the positive behaviors and then you decrease the negative behaviors. And that's called uh, operant conditioning. Um, there's attachment theory uh, developed by John Colby. And um, it's about early relationships with caregivers uh, playing a major role in child development. So like, um, you know, while you're not completely analytical and be able to think for yourself, there's uh, an attachment that occurs. It's more at the emotional level. And it influences social relationships throughout life. So children are born with an innate need to form attachments. So uh, when a baby is born, uh, regardless of their, you know, gender, um, ethnicity, you know, uh, whatever genes that they have inherited, they, there's a basic need to attach with other human beings. And so even if this person is born in an orphanage, the, the baby wants to actually uh, feel attached to the caregiver. And so um, depending on what kind of experience that you have with the caregiver, that is going to be general, that pattern is going to be generalized to other relationships that this person has in later life. So there's a basic survival need for any infant, right, to, uh, to receive care and protection. And so they seek it. And attachments are clear behavioral and motivational patterns. And there are different styles. One is a secure attachment style when uh, the child had, has a very, very positive experience with the caregiver. Could be mom and dad ideally, but then it could be grandparents, it could be uh, child caregivers, uh, it could be aunts, it could be anybody who actually regularly takes care of this child. And um, this child actually forms, like feels attached, like, oh, you know what, 
there's something here, like there's a regularity. Um, I want to be loved and protected by this person, so I'm going to actually um, do the things in order to make sure that this person stays with me, make sure that this person protects me and feeds me and, you know, uh, spends time with me. Um, so when they have a secure relationship, oh, you know what? I can relax because I know that when I cry, my mom comes around. When I uh, need diaper changes, she changes diapers. Um, oh, she is available regularly. And therefore, um, the world is a safe place and people are generally safe. Um, now this child is going to actually grow up to be able to trust other people. Uh, of course, you know, discernment needs to uh, be there too. But then um, generally, uh, anticipates like something positive is going to be formed when I want to interact with other people. Versus uh, ambivalent is this is like um, when a caregiver, mom or, mom or dad, you know, grandparents, child care caregivers, like whoever that might be, that has regular care for this uh, child, uh, has you know sometimes sometimes this person is available, other times not available. Sometimes this person meets the needs, other times not sometimes protects, other times not, then the child is very much confused. Like, I don't know um, what exactly to anticipate. Like, when I cry, this person sometimes shows up. Other times I cry and cry and cry, this person does not show up. Oh, uh, you know what? I'm really hungry and this person does not feed me regularly. Um, you know, like, sometimes does. Other times, like, there are times that I'm, like, so um, not well fed. Uh, then this per, you know child will develop ambivalent feelings about um, the child caregivers um, in general, and then so that gets translated into other relationships. So this person may feel like, oh, you know what? Am I gonna be accepted? Am I not gonna be accepted? You know, like I'm not sure. Um, and so then the interactions become kind of unstable. Avoidant, avoidant is. Uh, when this uh, child obviously has gone through some pains, um, you know, some abuse or maybe some uh, source by which he or she uh, learns that, you know, actually when I actually stay away from people, it's uh, safer, it meets my needs better. It's, um, you know, when I avoid the person, the person actually comes around and does better for me. You know things like that. Now, whatever the uh, situation was, um, the child has learned that uh, avoiding is the safest way of doing it. Or at least, you know, I'm not confused. You know, when I avoid, then I I know that, you know, I know what to expect. I'm not confused anymore. Um, this organized style is a mixture of ambivalent and avoidant. And uh, so, the first one is when you have. Um, been taken care of adequately by your child caregivers or parents or grandparents, but rest of the forms are when you're not adequately taken care of, and therefore um, it affects your social relationships and other uh, like later in life. Uh, psychosexual developmental theory is developed by um, Sigmund Freud. And it was a clinical work done with patients suffering from mental illness. So um, this was not necessarily based on like observing average individuals, but rather those people suffering from mental illness. And so uh, childhood experiences and unconscious desires influence behavior. So like your behavior is, um, you know, is governed by the unconscious desires. Is what he's saying and uh, conflicts that occur during each stage of these stages during each of these stages can have a lifelong influence on personality and behavior yes and and so develop uh, di different stages focused on different pleasure areas of the body so um, when you actually So yeah, he, he actually divides up the different stages and for each stage there's like oral stage, you know, genital stage and things like that. Um, and uh, um, that kind of demarks, it, it marks each stage. Um, 
and the failure to progress through a stage can uh, result in fixation. Yeah, so this is similar to like other other theories, like when you are not able to move on to the next stage, you know, you get fixated, and uh, that can influence the adult behavior. Personality is largely set in stone by the age five. Um, this may be, in, you know, coherent with other other um, theories as well. Personality is formed at a very early age, although it can change and evolve over time. But the, the overall picture does not change significantly. Social learning theory was uh, developed by um, Albert Bandura, and the conditioning and reinforcement process cannot sufficiently explain all of human learning. Yeah. So directly challenging um, Skinner, right? Behaviors can also be learned through observation and modeling, right? It's not just by conditioning, but modeling is very powerful. And so um, whatever your parents or immediate family members have done uh, by just living, you know, that's why living up the truth is important. When you have done certain things or when you have not done certain things in certain situations, that is going to be a powerful influence in the child. Observing parents and peers, children develop new skills and acquire new information. Also learn by listening to verbal instructions about how to perform a behavior, observing either real or fictional characters displaying behaviors in books or films. So um, these days, um, digital culture is really highly developed and is highly utilized as well. And so um, there are times when parents are have gone to work and the children are left with a babysitter and, you know, like, you know, there's a lot of uh, watching of TV or tablets or internet and the kids actually are highly influenced by that. And you can see the consequences of, of doing that today among the little children, uh, among the uh, older children too, when they have grown up with a certain kind of, you know, experience. Um, so modeling is very important. Jean Piaget's uh, Cognitive Development Theory um, they divided, he divided up the, up the stages according to a person's thought processes. How these thought processes influence how we understand and interact with the world um, are important. Um, and ch so children think differently than adults. The steps of, uh, and sequence of children's intellectual development is important. So there are different stages, um, sensory motor stage between birth and age two, very early. Behaviors are limited to simple motor responses, right? Uh, Pre-operational stage between age uh, 2 and 6 learns to use language and they don't understand concrete logic yet, but cannot mentally uh, manipulate information yet. Um, unable to take the point of view of other people, like your perspective is like this. But um, I think uh, kids Start from age of three, they gradually um, develop, I believe, um, other people's perspective. Like, oh, you know, like, you are angry because you, uh, I took away your toy and things like that, right? Um, concrete operational stage is seven to 11 age, uh, years of age. So gain better understanding of mental aid, uh, mental operations, and begin think, uh, thinking logically about concrete events. Um, but still struggle with abstract or hypo hypothetical concepts, which happens um, 12 through adulthood. Formal operational stage, develop the ability to think about abstract concepts, skills such as uh, logical thought, deductive reasoning, and systematic planning emerge. So age 12 is um, a very significant age um, around puberty, right? And then uh, Vygotsky's uh, sociocultural theory says uh, children learn actively and through hands-on experiences. So like experience is very important. Um, and experiences are, uh, have, have been proved to be very uh, powerful in terms of, uh, of the children's learning. And even the adults learning, um, we learn more by experiencing than just uh, reading the books. Although reading the books can be very powerful and it depends on how we are trained and each person is trained different way by the circumstances. But when we actually have gone through an experience, it really sticks to our memory. And next time when we face the same kind of situation or similar, 
then we can arrive at a conclusion uh, quicker, at a solution quicker. Parents, caregivers, peers, and the culture at large were responsible for developing higher order functions. Learning is an inherently social process. So you don't learn, uh, well, so some people are just isolated and in a very special situation and they have to just learn things through the things that are available. Maybe not many human beings are available around them, but mostly um, we learn with other people. We learn in a context of having other people around us. The zone of proximal development, the gap between what a person can do with help and what they can do on their own is, is the zone of proximal development. With the help of more knowledgeable others, people are able to progressively learn and increase their skills. And eventually, without the help, you are able to perform those skills. And uh, there's a comprehensive chart uh, that talks about development uh, through the lifespan on the next page. And uh, it, it is comprehensive in that it talks about the faith development, physical, brain, mental and intellectual, interpersonal, values and ethics, sexuality, family, and needs of age, gifts to share, vocation, and expectations of the church. And so um, we're going to talk a little about, bit about this next time. Um, it, it gives us a very, very comprehensive uh, picture of how development can take place, um, and it gives a holistic approach. Um, so um, it's valuable to take a look at that. But uh, having said that, we covered a lot of uh, materials today. I hope it's not too overwhelming to you. You can actually go back and check the, uh, the booklet yourself to review. And I hope you learned something valuable out of this. Uh, let's close in prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you so much for um, being the wisdom and guiding us through developmental stages. Lord, um, each one of us has positive and negative experiences. Each one of us have, has had um, different issues and conflicts um, in developmental stages. Lord, I ask you that you will come and heal our memories, heal our experiences, heal our um, hearts and minds, so that we'll be able to um, 